Moses, the man of God and the leader of Israel, ends his speech and says his last words. Words of courage and words of hope. On the Bible Brief. Want more Bible learning content like this? Sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. Links are in the show notes to this episode. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and the evil. If you obey the commandments of Yahweh your God that I command you today, by loving Yahweh your God, by walking in His ways, and by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God and obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. There is no easier choice than the one that Moses puts before Israel as he begins to wrap up his speech to the people. He puts before them obedience or rebellion, blessing or cursing, life or death. Having detailed the great blessing and prosperity that would accompany obedience, followed by the terrible curses that await rebellion, he encourages them to choose the right thing. Choose life, he says. Choose life that you and your offspring may live. Choose life and love Yahweh your God. Choose life and live long in the land promised to your fathers. Choose life. Despite the eventual rebellion already foretold, Moses knows that the obedience of the people can delay the judgment of God. He knows and remembers what God said to him on Sinai. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Moses remembers that though God will not clear the guilty, He will yet forgive the sin of those who will turn to him in faith. God is merciful, and he's gracious. And Moses says to the people, Choose life. Choose God. When faced with a choice like that, what else would you choose but blessing? With the Lord before you, blessing promised, the power of God to give victory and prosperity, what else would you choose? You would choose life. You would choose victory and you would choose obedience to God. And that's the choice that these Israelites would make too. That day, in the plains of Moab, they would choose life and obedience. But the problem isn't the initial choice. The problem is in the next choice and the next one. This offer that Moses gave to Israel wasn't an offer which results would be set in stone after the people's initial choice. This was an offer that was before all Israel, all the time. Each day and each moment they would have this choice before them. Obedience and blessing in the land, or rebellion and cursing away from the land. Their choice today would never guarantee their choice tomorrow, because with corrupt and uncircumcised hearts, they would fail to be faithful. They would fail to obey, and they would be driven out of the land. But that eventual exile doesn't render void today's choice. Each day and each generation would have the choice that Moses set before them. And every time this speech of Moses was read and proclaimed, his voice would echo through the pages, Choose life. After Moses encourages the people to choose life, he moves towards encouraging them yet again. He encourages them to obedience that he's called them to, 
and he reminds them of God's power to give them victory over the people dwelling in Canaan. Let's keep reading in Deuteronomy 31. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, You shall not go over this Jordan River. The Lord your God himself will go before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, says Moses. God won't leave you, nor will he forsake you. He will be with you in battle, and you have nothing to fear. But his words continue to the new leader taking over for him. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Directly to Joshua this time, Moses says essentially the same thing that he said to the people. Be strong and courageous. God won't leave you nor forsake you. He will be with you in battle, and you have nothing to fear. But then God's voice is heard in the same manner, with perhaps the greatest sentence of all at the end. And the Lord commissioned Joshua the son of Nun and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. God says to Joshua, I will be with you. Words not spoken by God, since he called the shepherd Moses out of the burning bush. I will be with you. What comfort Joshua must have had to hear the words of God affirming his leadership in the giant shadow of Moses. Moses had wielded the staff of God. He had parted the Red Sea and drawn water from the rock. He had delivered the law to the people at Sinai and led them on their wanderings through the wilderness. God had done all these things through Moses because he was with Moses. But now Joshua heard those words. God said, I will be with you. But Moses, for his part, wasn't quite done. Having written his speech in a book to the very end, he had two final things to say. One is a song, and one is a blessing. First, the song. This song is an important one, because it's a song written by God himself, and given to Moses to then give to the people. It's a song that God instructed that should be taught to all future generations as a witness for God against the people who will end up being rebels. But apart from that, it picks up a theme that we've already seen in two prior prophetic sections of Scripture. First, we saw this theme develop as Jacob blessed his twelve sons. Next, it was used before Balaam's final oracles. And here it's used again before this song of Moses. The theme is the words, in the end of days. Just before he tells the people this song, Moses says to the people that he will tell them what will happen to them in the end of days. This elevates this song and gives it a look from the mountaintop on the timeline to see far into the future. Now, due to the length of the song, we're only going to summarize it, because it rehashes much of what has been said so far. The people will go into the land. They will forget God, disobey Him, worship other gods, and Yahweh will use other nations to judge them and to take Israel away from Canaan. But eventually, God will vindicate His people Israel and have compassion on them. Israel's judgment will not last forever. The song that God gave to Israel through Moses is both a song of judgment and hope, in that order. The people will forget their God, but God will never forget His people. In the end of days, He will have compassion on them and vanquish their enemies. This song would be with the people for generations, immortalized in the text of their sacred scriptures and taught to each subsequent generation. But the song itself 
would have no power to keep the people from their wicked ways. They would eventually rebel against God. They would eventually be cast out of the land. And later, in the end of days, God will save them once again. Finally, Moses has one more task, one more thing to say, and in his final words, he blesses each of the twelve tribes of Israel. He blesses with a blessing that echoes that spoken by Jacob over four hundred years before. Moses blesses the twelve tribes just as he did, the people for which Moses has spent his whole life. Remember, earlier in his life, Moses had a choice too, but his choice was more difficult than the one that the people had today. Moses could have chosen to remain in the house of Pharaoh, having been raised by his daughter with all that the kingdom of Egypt could offer. He grew up with royalty and was spared from the slavery that the people of Israel were suffering. He was living the best life that one could live as an Israelite in Egypt. But he chose Israel over Egypt. He chose difficulty over pleasure. He chose faith in Yahweh over the gods of Egypt. And Yahweh used him in a mighty way. God had been with Moses for all his days. And now God would be with Moses in death as he dies outside of the land of Canaan. We read this in chapter 34, starting in verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord and he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab. Don't miss the intimacy of the relationship that God expresses here at the death of Moses. God himself buries Moses. The man of God is buried by God himself. Moses may have died outside the land due to God's judgment on his unbelief at Meribah, but God would yet have compassion on him in his death. Next we read this. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. The prophet Moses is dead. The final judgment on the older generation has been meted out, and a significant page is turning for the nation of Israel. No longer will they be stuck outside of Canaan. No longer would they wander. Now they will fight, with Joshua at their head, with God as their power, with blessing their goal. The people will be strong. They will be courageous. Israel will take the land of Canaan. Join us next time as we look back before we move forward. We will review the five books of Moses. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023.